Um, so I come every now and again to clinical events like this and I'm absolutely thrilled to come. I'm delighted to meet you guys who are helping us so much with our project by coming along time after time to the clinics and I listen to the work that Michelle and her clinical colleagues are doing and the talks here today and I think it's fantastic. So a huge thank you to you for dedicating your time to it and Michelle and her clinical fellows for driving around the Thames Valley region which we kind of extended up to Sheffield um, to, uh, to collect some of the sleep patients uh, and for all your efforts. So our own work is to work with um, uh, cell models in particular to try to answer this question. Now this is a really hard question, um, so we're still giving many patients L-DOPA, which we've been giving for about the last 50 years or so. How do we do something better? So it's a really difficult question to tackle, and I want just to tell you that we're working very hard at it, but it is difficult. But it is the ultimate aim, it is what we're here for at the end, to try and develop new drug targets. Drug discovery has not been working in the last 10 or 20 years or so. Drug development process is long. It takes a long time to think up the ideas what might make a good drug. It takes a long time to do this preclinical phase where we work in the laboratory, then move into the clinic through phase one, two, and three for final approval. It takes a long time, 10 years or more, and it's extremely expensive for one billion. Parkinson's UK are very generous in their funding, but they've not given us a billion. Um, but what we're doing is working our way down at this end here to try to develop new ideas. It's also getting harder. So this graph here in purple, which goes up, uh, shows the uh, money that's been spent on research to try to develop new drugs, and you see that's been going up. And this line in yellow is the number of drugs that have been approved for use across many different diseases. So the money that's going in is going up, and the number of drugs that are being developed is staying constant or even actually now falling, so it's getting harder. Many different reasons for this. Uh, perhaps it's because people haven't been asking the right questions or using the right models, using, say, cells from patients, for example, which are probably the best things to use. So we've got three reasons why we think we can give this a better go uh, for target and drug discovery here at the Parkinson Centre, and three reasons. The first is that we've studied many different types of cellular models. We've made cells and neurons from patients, from some of you. We've also made... Uh, cells from rats and mice that we've got that make Parkinson's, but they seem to have the same cellular problems, which suggests that we're onto the right thing. We're also able to use very new techniques to interrogate cellular pathology, to look at all the genes, see which genes are expressed, look at all the proteins and all the metabolites within cells, to try to see what's different between patients and controls. And thirdly, as I'll show you towards the end, we've had some funding from the Medical Research Council, the MRC, to put in place some really world-class facilities um, and tap into the expertise of others here in Oxford in target and drug discovery to apply to Parkinson's. So three routes, how are we going to do it? First, use the genes, understand the genetics. So um, we're able to uh, identify individuals who carry genetic changes which have contributed to their Parkinson's. We've made stem cells from skin biopsies from uh, some of you in the room. Uh, and then make neurons, brain cells, from those skin cells. So this is a process which we've been running for about five years now. Uh, Michelle or members of her clinical team will take a skin biopsy from a, a patient, uh, bring that back to the lab, chop it into little bits, lie, um, let the cells fall to the bottom of a plastic dish where we grow the cells. Sally Cowley, a researcher working in the Dunn School of Pathology, is able to convert these skin cells into stem cells. And then in my own laboratory, we're able to turn these stem cells into neurons, dopamine neurons, very similar to the ones that are dying in the brain. And this gives us Parkinson's disease in a dish. We can study these neurons from patients to better understand them, compare them to healthy neurons, and understand why these neurons are dying. So we've been doing this for a number of years. Why do we want to do it? Well, we want to understand the, the cellular pathways, understand what we call the, the cellular phenotype. What's the problem? What's different about these cells to understand why they die? This gives us a window into the disease. So genetic Parkinson's is rare. Maybe only 2 or 3% of patients have a genetic change. But it allows us to understand this working in the laboratory. And hope, we hope that will then inform us on the, the more common sporadic forms. And hopefully we can give us cellular evidence to support the clinical findings. So because Michelle and her team have worked so hard not to just diagnose Parkinson's within the cohort, but specific subtypes of Parkinson's, understand stratification. 
Maybe those cells in the dish will behave differently depending on whether they've come from a patient, for example, who had impulse control disorder or didn't. And also we're working to support biomarker discovery. So we're able to take the blood samples that you've given or the CSF samples and see if we can find protein changes in there that might predict Parkinson's. We can also take the, the medium, the liquid that we grow these cells in in the lab to see if we can find proteins released into that medium that might tell us about biomarkers in the blood. And ultimately, once we have these cells and we know what's wrong, we can screen for therapeutic molecules which put the problem right in cells. Maybe that would work in patients. So we've been um, making these stem cell-derived neurons now for a number of years. On the left is a, an image, a microscopic image that we take in the laboratory showing uh, neurons that we've grown in red. And dopamine neurons, these are the neurons we really want to study are in green. So these are the ones we wish to study. And we can see on the right, these cells have electrical activity. That's what neurons do. They fire electrical signals. So we can see this through the imaging here and then also through the electrical analysis here. So these neurons are doing exactly what they should. So we can now grow these from patients and controls and ask what's different. So we might have looked perhaps at the electrical activity. These neurons will fire, bap, 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 fire away at about five or ten times a second um, giving an electrical signal. Maybe that's different between the patients and controls. We haven't found it is yet. We look at chemical release. So these neurons are releasing dopamine. Maybe the neurons from patients and from controls release dopamine slightly differently. We haven't found that yet. Maybe it's to do with energy. That's a picture of a mitochondria, the powerhouses within the cell that produce our energy. We think there are some differences in energy generation in the brain cells of patients versus controls. We're still looking at that. But what we found is differences in, in cell biology, the way the cell recycles material for use. So all our cells in our body have a, um, a recycling system. We have a green bin that we can put things in where we want to reuse the proteins. And this is going on in all of us all the time. We have some bits of the cell that engulf the things we want to recycle. This then fuses with a lysosome which has acidic content and it can degrade and recycle this material. Parkinson's cells really need this to happen. They've got a lot of protein material, such as the alpha-synuclein we've heard of, that they need to recycle. They need a big bin. They get the process going, but it stops. It can't progress. So the material builds up, perhaps like a rubbish pile. We can't recycle it properly. The brain cells can't recycle it. So they eject it. They throw it out. They release protein that they should be recycling. And the main protein we find they release our friend alpha-synuclein that you've heard about a minute ago. So these cells are not able to recycle it properly, so they throw it out, and it might then spread to the next brain cell. So we found that out. Second thing we could do is look at the genes that are expressed. So look at the genes that are made inside the cell. So we've been able to make the, the stem cells, the dopamine neurons uh, from patients, and look at genes that go up in patients, and look at those that go down. And we can look at all the genes, all the 20,000 genes we have, see what goes up, what goes down, and see what we can infer from that. So this is a new technique that's been developed here in Oxford. I think it's one of the specialities of our centre. So this is an experiment that we did in, in uh, our laboratory. We took uh, six stem cell lines, so those lines made from three healthy controls, three patients who carry a mutation in a gene called LARC2. We made these dopamine neurons, they're the ones in red down the microscope. And we then used a technique to purify those neurons. We've just got those dopamine neurons, extracted RNA. RNA is what the cell makes when a gene is expressed, so extracted all the RNA, and compared uh, the gene expression that we see in these neurons from real post-mortem brain tissue. And it's exactly the same. So the neurons that we've got and are making the dish are making exactly the same genes as we're uh, making right now inside our, our midbrain, the dopamine neurons. So that's a good start. And then we compared, we looked at the genes made in a patient versus those made in a control. What's different? Well, we found 168 genes. Some went up and some went down. And they weren't just 168 genes chosen randomly from our 20,000. They were linked in networks and pathways. They were doing similar things. So. The clever bit that Caleb Weber, my colleague down, in, down the hill in the science area, is able to do is to take the list of genes that go up and the list of genes that go down and look to see if that looks like known changes that drugs are known to do. 
or someone else has done these experiments. And the, one of the closest mimics of this up and down was a drug called rotenone. Now, rotenone is known to cause Parkinson's, and it's used, for example, to make Parkinson's uh, rats as a, a rotenone study. So the gene expression changes we saw looked like this known Parkinson toxin. And then the really clever bit that Caleb did is to ask what drugs might change the same genes in exactly a different way, the opposite way. So maybe they might correct the problem. And we found a drug called clearquinol. So I dropped out my um, uh, computer and typed clearquinol and Parkinson's into Google. And unfortunately, someone's got there first. There's a drug patent taken out on treating Parkinson's with clearquinol in 1999. It's been used for moderate success in some Alzheimer's trials. And in 2003, in this journal called Neuron, it was shown to cure a mouse with an induced Parkinsonism. So, does this mean we should put it in patients? Probably not quite yet. There's a company in Australia that's already doing this, and they're testing it for use in Alzheimer's and Huntington's as well. So, but what this does show is the approach could identify some interesting drugs. And if this approach works, one of the conversations that Michelle are going to have, and I are going to have over and over again in the next few years, is when do we know we've got something that might work? Route three, forget all the genes, just look at the cells. So this third route we're doing in my lab to try and identify new drugs and new targets. Um, we have identified the deficit in the cell biology and cell models of Parkinson's. We don't know why they occur, but we know what the deficits are. Can we identify compounds which might correct those deficits? So uh, Rebecca Wallings in my laboratory has been making neurons, brain cells from our new Parkinson's rats. So earlier this year, we published a new genetic model, a type of rat which carries mutations in LARC2, the same gene we looked at in the stem cells. And over time, when it gets to about 18 months, which is about the same age as 65, 70 in people, these rats get a movement disorder, they wobble around, and they can be cured with L-DOPA. So we think they're a really good model. So what Becky's been able to do is to make neurons from these rats and study the same pathways we looked at before. So this is the pathway, this is the material that we want to degrade and break down. It's engulfed by these um, membranes. And then here's the lysosome, this big acidic compartment that's going to engulf them. So what Becky can do is stain these parts green, this part red, and when they merge, you'll get yellow. So she spends a lot of time in the lab counting yellow dots, red dots, and green dots down the microscope to see how this process is happening. How much green have we got? How much red have we got? And then when they come together, we get yellow. So this is the, the green, the red, and the yellow. Let's look at the neurons from our patient rats, if you like, and our controls. So the non-transgenic, these are the control. They have some green, some yellow, and some red. These are the rats that carry this genetic mutation. Look at the amount of green they've got. This process gets going, right? But there's no lysosomes, there's no red to receive them, and so they, there's not much yellow. These green ones are desperate for the recycling. Then what she's done is to find a drug that helps this part get going. So she treats the non-transgenic rats, and we see uh, this drug causes an increase in the green, which is this part here causes an increase in the red, which is these guys here, and lots of yellow where they come together. She's treated the rat neurons with the Parkinson's mutation with the same drug, and it's really interesting. This is the green, so we get going. And remember, this has more green to start with. You add the drug and you don't get more green. But the drug gives you lots of red. The drug makes more lysosomes appear, so therefore you'd think the red and the green are going to come together, but they don't. In these rats, the mutation means that there's lots of green and lots of red, and we can't get fusion. So what we're going to do in this experiment, working with uh, one of the Drug Discovery Institutes in Oxford, is to test compounds to see if we can get this fusion to happen, and that might be a way to correct this. We're going to do this because we've been given £3 million by the Medical Research Council to start a new stem cell centre, which is now up and running and ready, and this will be a stem cell centre to make the stem cells make the neurons, also the rat neurons as well, study them and screen for new drugs based on phenotype. The cellular phenotype, if you remember, is what you might call the problem, and see if we can find drugs that correct the problem. So this is a new laboratory, which is on the floor above mine in the uh, Department of Physiology and Anatomy and Genetics. Six rooms for us to find a drug for Parkinson's. 
So here we have a new tissue culture room. These are tissue culture hoods where we grow our cells and these are the incubators that we keep them in. I took this picture last week, it's just been completed. This is a big freezer. So what we do is hope to get some drug compounds in, AstraZeneca, the ones who might give us some, I'm trying to get them to give us some, and we'll put them in the freezer. Then we've got equipment here which will dispense those drugs into the uh, plates using uh, plates with 96 or 394 little wells in them. We can then got equipment, this is a, an Opera Phoenix, which is a, an imaging machine that can take a photograph, it can take 100 photographs in every well of a 384 well plate quickly. So that'll be useful. Other bits of equipment that'll test the efficacy of these drugs in a high throughput way. Uh, some microscopy to look at, this microscope and some electrophysiology to look at the electrical activity of the neurons. And this is requiring a lot of data, so we've got 200 terabytes of department data space to store it on. So this is about to get going. When the Phoenix came, uh, it costs about as much as a semi-detached house in Summertown, but they did give us a cake with it. <laughs> this is a, a cake from Perkin Elmo in the same shape as the Phoenix, so that was very tasty, and they gave us that when they came to start the training. So this is in place, we've been trained on it, and we're getting going. So this provides us the opportunity and the equipment. So, this has all happened because it starts with the patients. Our work all starts with you, who are able to contribute the samples to our work. We provided the skin biopsies, we make the stem cells to make the neurons, and those are the ones we study in the lab. So using that, we've understood what's wrong with the, uh, the neurons in, that have come from the, the patients, and we're now screening for potential drugs or new targets, drugs that might correct that in the, patient, in the neurons. We then have, that um, I haven't talked about, some excellent... Uh, physiologists who work with our Parkinson's animal models that we can then test these drugs into. And ultimately, it'll take a long time, but ultimately having identified drugs that might do neuroprotection to save the neurons or symptomatic relief, we would then later be in a position to move back to patients. This is going to be, this is the key thing that we have to do, but it's going to be really difficult. We'll find many things that work in neurons. And Michelle and I and others on the team will have to decide at what point you then continue around this process and maybe there's some drugs that have been used before in patients that you might go straight from the cells to the patients and avoid the animals. So this is what we're here for. It's going to be a big challenge, but you know, every year I come along and tell you I think we're a little bit further along it, um, but that's what we're up to. So this is a, obviously a team effort. These are some members of my lab who are doing the work, uh, and Michelle and her clinical team, Sally who makes the stem cells, and uh, Caleb who's done the clever network analysis. And thank you very much for your continued and strong support. Thank you.